Welcome to our first ever interview at the Nuva Healthcare HQ. I'm joined today by Dr. John Roberts, a holistic dentist with over 40 years in practice. And I would arguably say one of the industry pioneers in not only holistic dentistry, but also biological dentistry. And today we're gonna to be discussing the past, present and future of true health orientated dentistry. So I just want to start this interview sharing a little bit about Dr. John Roberts. I've actually worked with John for over eight years and I've been very fortunate to be able to call him a friend. One of the things that really gravitated me towards John was the fact that he was able to see beyond the mouth. He's actually looked at the effect oral health has on a person's entire well-being. This way of listening and understanding has allowed John to be able to teach other like-minded practitioners, not just here in the UK, but in Europe, Asia, and in North and South America. So John, what led you into dentistry, and in particular, holistic dentistry? I think the honest answer is dentistry was something to do at university, and I've always wanted to help people. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's different careers you gravitate to, and it was just helping people. I had family who were in the medical field, and therefore I gravitated toward it. Um, I went in, I qualified in 1981 from Leeds University and very much was an NHS dentist for the first four or five years of my career. Oh, wow. Got married, started a kid and then I wanted my own business. So in 1987, I set up my practice in Rochdale, again, very much NHS orientated. And at that stage, we didn't have Facebook and, and all this marketing that there is now, but I wanted to have a unique practice. And I was very fortunate to meet someone who said, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I pursued avenues that other dentists didn't, such as TMJ and jaw joint problems, yeah. which we'll come to. But it just led me on a, a track of questioning things. Now, the nice thing was there wasn't the internet then. There wasn't pick up your phone and Google something. You actually had to either go to the library or order a book. And because of my nature, I just got on a plane and went to America to learn and then came back again. <laughs> Wife didn't like it too much, but it, it, it gave me an opportunity to see yeah. things that weren't right in front of you. Yeah. I also was fortunate enough, patients came to see me because I like my attitude and they would tell me things such as, what do you think about homeopathy? Mm. Well, if I didn't know about it, I wouldn't dismiss it. I'd say, I don't know. I'll go and find out. 100%, yeah. Someone told me about, are mercury feelings harmful for your health? Well, the standard line is, no, they're perfectly face, safe and fine. And I thought, you know what? I don't know. And I love saying I don't know because then me and my personality means I go away and find out. So I started looking about mercury feelings, came across Hal Huggins, came across the IOMT. And before you know it, I am questioning putting mercury fillings in. And then it evolved into traveling to America in 19, I think 92, maybe 93. I just made the decision not to put them in people's mouths until I was sure they were safe, a bit like with smoking, until we're sure it's safe, don't do it. Mercury fillings, in my opinion to this day, mm. aren't safe. It's a choice to have them, obviously. Yeah. I then decided I wasn't going to use them, so I had to go private. It wasn't private because I wanted to earn more money. I wasn't allowed to work within the NHS. I got in a bit of bother for that. But then I found people who were wanting to have their health improved by perhaps taking out mercury fillings. It's not the only thing I would do, but it's that's what led me into the whole thing. And then we started looking at herbs and nutrition for healing. We looked at homeopathy. We looked at other aspects about how dentistry may influence your health. Yeah. One thing we may touch upon is the whole issue about root canals. Are they safe for our health? Do they harm our health? And I am such a fortunate man. Coming up 65, never been ill. I haven't had that aha moment that, oh my goodness, my life needs to turn around. I have had a good life, done what I wanted, but I've listened to people. And when they've got a concern, I go away and find out. Some people, I don't think that their, their concerns are justified, but a lot about mercury, possibly about fluoride, about root canals, about sleep and breathing. All of those things, someone has influenced me. I've gone away and learned and developed my style of care. Mm -hmm. And I think, excitingly, I've just come back from a, a conference in America two weeks ago yeah. where 
they are now pulling all this together from a child being born with a tongue tie to a person in a nursing home with Alzheimer's. And dentistry has a role to play yeah. in everything about us and our health. And although I've lectured in the past, perhaps very cheekily saying, I'm not interested in your white bits, it is the white bits can influence the whole of the body and what we do with our mouth, what we do with our breathing. And if I can share some of that with you today, really happy to do so. Oh, John, we're so excited to learn about the breathing and the, the mouth thing, you know, how the mouth plays a pinnacle role of it. I think one of the most interesting things that you said was like the IAOMT and for our viewers here, that's the International Academy of Mercury Toxicology, which John actually brought into the UK many, many years ago, if I'm correct. Yeah, it was 1995. Um, I went to America. I love what I saw so much. I thought, we've got to do it in the UK. So silly me lined up, uh, associated with a dentist in Harley Street, and we then organized the first conference. So we had people like Murray Vimy, who did the research on sheep, who did the research on monkeys, who showed mercury comes off the fillings and yeah. gets into the body. Yeah. Published in the mm -hmm. highest rated scientific journal there is. Uh, we had people from the uh, then Protection Society saying, Maybe there's a little well, bit. Okay. We had people from oh, all over the world lecturing. And I really thought 95, and we had another super conference in Oxford in 2000, really thought, that is it. We acknowledge mercury comes off your fillings. We acknowledge mercury gets stored in the body. We acknowledge that mercury stored in the body causes health issues. Mm -hmm. But you know what? We're still using it today. And although there's big advisories on children under the age of 16, pregnant and nursing mums, Really, it is a go-to filling for certainly NHS dentists, and it's unfortunate that because that's all they get paid to do. But even private dentists will put in private mercury fillings. So you pay more for the privilege of being poisoned because it is a poison whichever way you speak at it, and it's how much of a poison is it. From the back of that, then my knowledge grew. I then started not doing orthodontics and taking teeth out. So you can do orthodontics for most people, and never categorically say 100%, but for most kids, if you start early enough, you don't take teeth out. That means they breathe better. That means they are healthier. They teeth fit together better. They're less likely to get gum disease in later life or perhaps get decay. So all of these things we do with children has yeah. a knock-on effect. And I have a favorite line where I say to a, a mother, brings their child in, I would like to give your child 28 teeth in a straight line, fitting together the way nature intended. And dentistry has gone off that. We should be going back to nature, how we were 100, 200 years ago, how you see, dare I say, the third world kids, because they've all got fabulous teeth. You see the kids in Brazil, you see the kids in some parts of Africa. One thing that strikes you, big, broad, healthy smiles. And yet in our country, it doesn't happen. And all we're trying to do is push you up hill towards what real health is. Yeah, except I think what you kind of said there and talked about is, you know, the, the mouth for me is a starting point of, of anything to do with your gut. Because realistically, there's there's a conversation now coming out about leaky mouth and how like what because we have our food first in our mouth and we chew it down. That's the first impact of nutrients into the system. And that's going into our gums and into linked into our into our system and that's going into our gut. So we always say that whatever's happening in your mouth and what you're putting in has a massive effect on it. So I'm guessing from your point of view as a holistic dentist is you're saying that it's, it starts from the mouth. The mouth is one point, but we treat the mouth to treat the entire body. Is that, is that, is that am, I, am I right there? You're 100% right. And again, from a newborn child, yeah. even breastfeeding, Breastfeeding grows and develops, but it also gives the microbiome, and it's the word of the moment at the moment. <laughs> and when you suddenly realize London has a microbiome different to Paris has a different microbiome, our eyes have a microbiome, our brain has a microbiome. We know the microbiome in our mouth is crucially important. Yeah. The microbiome is affected whether the foods you put in your mouth, whether it's natural or all these high fructose corn sugar um, foods, you get different bugs. And we relate the decay that we see in kids to the high sugar, but some kids can live with high sugar diets, other kids can't. Maybe it is a microbiome that is a modifying factor. If you have a child who sits there and chronically mouth breathes, we call it the Nintendo mouth, that is going to affect the microbiome. For the conscientious middle-aged person who's using certain proprietary mouthwashes mm -hmm. that kill the microbiome, 
the microbiome produces nitric oxide. The nitric oxide is such a healthy thing. It does help um, kill um, COVID in the nose. And that's why some of the treatments for COVID was nitric oxide up the nose to kill uh, where COVID was. That's why they swabbed your nose. If you produce nitric oxide, it'll help kill COVID. But by using the commercial mouthwashes, it kills the microbiome. It stops you producing nitric oxide. Clinical studies, depends on whose science you watch, and we'll come into that, will actually put your blood pressure up. So natural mouthwashes, maybe the coconut oil pulling that we hear about. But then you go all the way through if you have gum disease in later life, there are bugs that you live in. And we have a system where we can take some plaque out your mouth and look at the microbiome. Mm -hmm. There's one thing doing, DNA test. Yeah. Get a swab, put it on a microscope slide. You can see the bacteria that are living in your mouth. You will find amoeba. And if anyone tells me there aren't amoeba in your mouth, well, argue with my microscope because I see it. <laughs> but if you find spirochetes in the mouth in older people, you find spirochetes and spirochetes DNA in the brain of people with Alzheimer's. Don't tell me there isn't a connection. And the science is telling us this. So perhaps when I started in 81 and when, you know, started my own practice in 87, where if I didn't know, I would say so. Now, I will say, here's my science. You show me your science and we'll have a grown-up debate on not who is right, but the influence of that science. I will show you mercury comes off your fillings, mercury gets stored in your body, Anyone who's going to argue that mercury is safe, whatever level, then really needs to show me what is a safe level of mercury. Because any research from environmental sciences throughout the world will say there is no observable safe level of mercury. And therefore, why are we putting it in and saying it's only a little bit? Let's just not use it at all. But it means a complete rethink in dentistry. Mm. So is, is that like what kind of brought you brought you into that holistic dentistry side? Was it looking at all of that research that you did when you first started and then you thought, you know what, I need to change this myself. So would you say that that's what attributed to becoming a holistic dentist or should I say a biological dentist, whichever you prefer? Um, I think it's a great time to define what biological and holistic are. And oh, please do. Biological is... This is how the body should work. This is how the teeth should fit together. These are the bugs that should live in your mouth. This is how you should swallow. And I was doing that in 1990, 1991, learning how to breathe properly, how to swallow properly, put the teeth where nature intended them to be because we never quite got there. And all of a sudden, things work well. I have got patients 35 years ago who still see me. We did some of that work and it's proved its worth. And I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying, we gave people choices and they followed that choice. So biological dentistry is how we think the body should work. Mm -hmm. But we're all living with a compromise. We live in a compromise because we don't get out in the sun. We eat the foods we shouldn't. We, we live stressful lives. Yeah. So biological dentistry is a goal, but we never quite get there. Holistic dentistry can also be viewed as, oh, I want to use homeopathy or herbs instead of antibiotics. And that is grateful, but the whole thing is sometimes you have to use antibiotics. You have to do certain things. And what you're doing is you're giving people a broader palette to paint from. If you want to use herbs and homeopathics, absolutely fine. And I use them a lot, but we still have the best, what modern medicine, because if I get someone with a face that's swollen and a big neck, you know what? Antibiotics could save their lives. Oh, 100%. I think like this, this idea that like, things like antibiotics shouldn't be used when people kind of have that hardline approach i always say antibiotics have benefited human society so much yeah. and sometimes you do need to cleanse everything from the system and rebuild again and i think that is one of the big parts of like dentistry as well because sometimes you need to look at the teeth cleaning it down and then rebuilding it from scratch again because when you do you know they say was it every three months you should go see a hygienist or was it every six months and that really brings up a great point because two points off that, dogma, and there's too much dogma in dentistry. You shouldn't have root canals, you shouldn't have mercury fillings, you shouldn't take teeth out. What you should really do, and the point that I want everyone to get is, you do the treatment for, that's appropriate for that person at that moment in time. So I can say my father yeah. passed away uh, in his late 80s, and he still had mercury fillings. Would he be in a better person if I had to take them out? I don't know. But you can't just say, carp like, you should take fillings out. You can't say root canals are bad for you because yeah. I can give you both ways. So you treat the individual, not what you do. We have 
a raft of dental specialities, be they implants or cosmetic work, and they want to give you beautiful smiles because that's what they do. And some of the more holistic biological dentists do what they do rather than saying, you're an individual, what's right for you? Because it's not only the dentistry, a bit like biohacking for dentistry. Can they afford it? Are they in the right place? Do they have other priorities? And so, so long as you stabilize them, give them a plan going forwards, whether it takes a year or five years. I've been pe treating people for 10 years. We still haven't got to that finished state, but they're not getting any worse. And if every time we see someone, their health is improving or at, long, at least not deteriorating, that's what real dentistry is because everything we do is a compromise and you've got to balance it to that person's needs. 100% John. I think you I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there with like talking about the idea that we get people to a certain place and the thing is you do need to look at budgets you do like we're in an age now we're going through you know another inflationary period interest rates are rising and people are looking at their what their household income income is and so people need like small steps that they can like you know I say these small little changes will have a massive effect because just like your health falls down it's like a domino effect you know one domino falls the domino goes down and it's like a build up of it over time and so being able to put those dominoes back up again and get your health back slowly is a really, really good start. And I think that really, really kind of like hits that bit there. Um, the, the big thing there is, and the easy one is mercury fillings. We agree mercury fillings aren't good for us and our health. Yeah. But the dilemma of taking mercury fillings out, whatever the cost, yeah. what happens if then you have a problem with the tooth and you need a root canal and it's more cost, but I don't want root canals, so you're having a tooth out and then you've got a denture or you've got implants getting more and more thousands. So, you know, perhaps a 150 pound filling turns into a 5,000 pound implant. Wow. Got to give people choices. And any dentist worth his salt should be giving patients choices. And I'm not saying leave mercury fillings in. I'm just saying do it when it's the right time and for what reason. You see a young, fit 30-year-old person and you've got to say, well, maybe there are products you can take. And yes, we're going to talk about Toxoprevent. But that will bind to the mercury that's coming off your fillings. And if you're completely flushing the system through, I'm not saying you should leave it, but I'm not saying you should take it out. You give it to the person as an option. If, however, you're seeing someone who is chronically ill and they've got mercury fillings and you can see that there's a toxicity going on, you've got to have a conversation with them. Yeah. And it's giving people choices and any good dentist should give people choices and understand it's not just drilling out a filling, it's affecting the whole of the person, the whole of the body. John, one of the things you talk a lot about is this whole body dental health. What do you actually mean by that? It really means what is happening in the mouth can have influences throughout the body. And again, if, if perhaps on my journey, I've broken it down to into the materials that are used in the body. So that's where we come to the mercury. Mercury doesn't stay in the teeth, it gets to the body. It affects the whole of the body. And you look at the research on MS or maybe Alzheimer's as an issue that mercury doesn't stay in the, in the, in the teeth, it affects the body. So the materials we use in the mouth can affect the body. We know and it's, it's out there now that the health of the gums influences the health of the body. Uh, you, higher risk for diabetes, heart disease, stroke risk, preterm low birth weight babies. And if you look at some of the research on Alzheimer's and dementia, as I've said, you find bacteria in the mouth, in the brain, and there's a causal link between the whole things. So a healthier mouth with gum disease is associated with a healthier person gets a little bit more complicated when we talk about root canals because root canals are a dentist's great way of saving teeth, dare I say saving money. And there's a time and a place maybe to do root canals and I'll qualify that. But if you have a root canal, you have to acknowledge it's always infected. There are always bacteria living in. It's not just colonizing, bacteria live in there and they can have a detrimental effect throughout the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. There's no other part of the body we preserve, pickle, but still leave bacteria in, but we do with teeth. That has a whole body effect and we've got to acknowledge it and give people a choice. But I think the biggest thing whole body dentistry is now coming into is this whole aspect of breathing, sleeping, snoring, oxygenation, posture. And this is where more and more dentists are now starting to work with body workers, be they osteopaths, chiropractors, physios, cranial workers. How your teeth fit together is like a cranial bone. When your teeth fit together, 
they fit a certain way. Your saliva is the synovial liquid, is the synovial fluid. But if you bite together wrong, it can twist your body. And this can lead to headaches, head, neck, shoulder problems. And it's universally accepted that dentists can treat all of those issues. What we've never really understood is the mechanisms. And this is where you have to embrace. When I went to America to learn myofunctional therapy, how to swallow properly, how to breathe properly, I had to bring back American videos. Now you can just go on Google, you can go on YouTube and read it all. So it's applied knowledge. And that's what the internet has brought us, is applied knowledge. But you've got to look at all the knowledge out there and find what sits comfortably for you. But anyone who denies swallowing properly, breathing properly, correct posture, even now when we're talking, is important. And you want to get away from the Nintendo mouth for the kids, but it's the same as the old person in the nursing home. Lips open, tongue to the floor of the mouth, breathing through the mouth. That affects your physiology. We can do the chemistry now. Whereas if you sit upright, tongue to the roof of your mouth, lips together, can't talk then, but that's our posture. You will better oxygenate, your pH will be better, the body will function better, which is why dentistry has now grown all our myofunctional therapists, our breathing therapists, our swallowing therapists. But then you need a dentist to put the teeth where the body wanted them to be, going back to that principle of biological dentistry again. Yes, we have variations. And there are plenty of people out there who will say, yes, but what about this? Yes, but what about that? Why not work with the percentages? Why not work as, let's deal with the 70% or 80% of people who are going to fall into the average. We can deal with the 20% that aren't average, the people who are missing teeth, the people whose skeletons aren't quite right. But why not set your target out to treat the 80% who are going to fall into the normal category, 28 teeth in a straight line, fitting and working together, tongue to the roof of your mouth, lips together, breathing through your nose. That would make so many more people healthy. So do you can kind of like, do you think this whole body health approach is not just encompassing the idea of the mouth and like fit the teeth together? You, you believe that the major role is that breathing side of it? Because like, I'm a big believer in breathing anyway, but I always say like, they say that when we're born, babies are naturally, they, they naturally have their mouth closed and they breathe in through their nose and they breathe into their stomach. So part of your whole body health in dentistry are you saying that you then teach people how to breathe properly from the moment a child is born yeah. and for about 10 years i had a reputation as a dentist who was seeing babies who had tongue ties lip ties yeah, yeah, you remember who couldn't yeah. breastfeed yeah and you know what you change the child you change that child for the rest of their life yeah and children who couldn't breastfeed it was a one minute procedure with a laser uncomfortable for 30 seconds but you've changed a child's life but that child then breastfeeds that grows the jaw better yeah. they then naturally will have the tongue to the roof of your mouth they will naturally have their their lips together and you'll see the child who gets a cold and they'll have those candlesticks coming up and down because we are born to be nose breathers but because we have environment because we bottle feed t kids too soon they end up opening their mouth, they breathe through the mouth, it's a less energy, you don't get the growth and development of the jaws, you don't get the correct pH. From then, it starts. And then you go and see dentists who are quite happy to fill teeth rather than saying, why have we got decay in the first place and spend time with the parents, nutrition, supplements, whatever. You then have orthodontics and teeth taken out, which compounds the problems of breathing, swallowing, posture, and then I think it's coming full circle because now you're seeing the elder population, 60s, 70s, 80s. These are the people who, if you look at the work, for example, of Dale Bredesen, who's saying Alzheimer's and dementia is optional, but part of it is reconnecting the dots, yeah. trying to get your lips together, trying to get your breathing through your nose, getting rid of the toxins in your mouth. So dentists have filled up their reservoir of all the things that we could have done differently and then dentistry to help the recovery from Alzheimer's and dementia. Again, look at his research. You don't have to believe me. Dale Bredesen is the person. Then you will see that dentistry has a role to play in the healing, a second phase of people, the people who want to keep well, but are starting to lose their health in their 70s and 80s. I think that is very important though, John. I think you, know, you talk about the research. I think what we'll do for like our viewers is we're going to put the research that you talked about today 
in the description so people can do their own research. I think that's so important when you're listening to someone like yourself who's had, you know, for over four years of experience. For us as the, you know, the average Joe, we want to read the research ourselves. Yeah. I think you talking about explaining is good, but what we would say is look at the research yourself and actually make your own conclusion, but also look at other people, talk to other people and get that knowledge together. Because, you know, the more we learn and you don't you don't have to agree with everything. I would say, like, you don't have to just agree with everything that you read. But as long as you're open minded enough to understand it and give it an opportunity, maybe it will fit into your into your life. Maybe it won't. But I think that's what your career has given you is that 40 years is you've managed to like, you've looked at so many things, you've gone to different lectures, you've gone to the speakers and you've slowly built your holistic package or your biological package. And, you know, one of the things that always, always struck people to when we did, you know, the eight years that we've known each other, we, the conference that we've been to, it's the network that you've had because it wasn't just dentists you had in the room. It was naturopaths. It was nutritionists. It was functional medicine practitioners. There was the even odd average Joe who just really liked your work and wanted to see it. And I think that is like a, a you know, it's a, a testament to your learning and individual and how you become this, you know, what I would call Dr. Mercury or Mr. Mercury in England. Because yeah. I, I, sorry, John, yeah. I've got to, yeah. I've got to say, I've always called yeah. Dr. Mercury because for me, for me, you're personally like you're my hero when it came to it. Because I thought, oh, you know what, John? Because I remember when we first met and you talked about the different topics of mercury, and I think you know, eight odd years ago, I was naive. I didn't know a lot of stuff, and all you did was kind of like open the door to so many different sections. And um, so, so for everyone, if you if you know, we do a lot of work on vitamin D optimization, and not many know this. I talked about La, Dr. Lars von Olesik quite a bit, who's one of my uh, colleagues who actually brought me into the industry of vitamin D. But would you believe John was actually one of the peoples during the entire pandemic, pre-pandemic, you know, well, who remembers what a pandemic is these days? Uh, he was talking a lot about vitamin D, and so. One of the things that you opened my eyes up to, and I couldn't believe it, was the role of vitamin D in dental health. So, John, you have to tell us, what the heck is the role of vitamin D in dental health? Yeah. And as we <laughs> talked about earlier, the whole thing is, if I didn't know, it's easy to say, I don't know, I don't believe it, rather than I'll go away and find out. Yeah. And so I have stood on the shoulder of giants and I've been influenced by great people. Uh, there's a lady I saw in America, say, two or three weeks ago, Stasha Gominitz. I'll give you the, the research. Please do. I mean, and if you listen to this lady, you'll suddenly realize vitamin D is not a vitamin. It's a hormone. Oh, 100%, John. It is a hormone that the body produces. Yeah. But if you don't give it what it produces, which is sunlight, then we end up deficient. The difficulty, and you can put it to the analogy for those who perhaps are more aware, you need cholesterol to produce all your sex hormones. And if you reduce your cholesterol levels, you may then not produce all the hormones you need. Cholesterol is an essential nutrition. So sunlight is an essential nutrition. That's how we survive. That's how animals survive. The trouble is we don't go out in the sun because we're concerned about other issues. We then put sun protector on and all of a sudden we are all vitamin deficient. And again, don't believe me, Google it. There was a fantastic dentist who did all the research on root canals and then got booted out of every dental association called Western Price. And he wrote a fantastic book on nutrition and physical degeneration. So he traveled the world in the 30s. He went to the more primitive tribes where we had primitive tribes. And he said, why do all these primitive tribes have beautiful broad arches, beautiful teeth and great broad flat noses? And why is it when they move into cities, the parents had decay, the children had decay and crowded mouths. And he was saying, is it something we do nutritionally? And even at that stage, he speculated there was something in the diet that the more natural tribes had, that the, the, the uh, civilized tribes didn't. And he called it substance P. We now know, because we can now test vitamin D since substance the 70s. P. Substance P, okay. I think he called it. Yeah. He knew it, but he didn't know how to measure it. We probably suspect that's vitamin D because vitamin D has a role in children and sleeping. Don't believe me, look at the research. Just Dr. Google will tell you that. Um, there's this exciting thing that we don't exploit as dentists where teeth are living. And we know teeth are living because if you drill into a tooth and it hits the nerve, ow, it's still alive. Yeah. But a tooth has a natural self-cleansing mechanism. It's called dentine fluid flow. Look it up. But in essence, a bit like a tree, it draws in nutrition and water 
goes up the tree and out the leaves. The body is taking in fluids, it's coming up the tooth and flushing the tooth clean. And that's what protects us from bacteria. That is what keeps some people's teeth free of decay, even though they're eating sugars and everything like that. The trouble is when our nutrition changes or maybe our vitamin D levels change, the body goes to sucking fluids from outside the mouth into the tooth and that's what will allow bacteria in and then they track it into the tooth. So this dentine fluid flow is significantly influenced by vitamin D and there are researchers showing very low D deficiencies will be associated with decay but you've got to talk about what's the optimum level of vitamin D that we should all take and I think you've in previous webinars have said low vitamin D we've over underestimated significantly the safe levels of D we can take on a daily basis. We've also got to go back and look at when we get sun, like it's a reasonably sunny day today, in the early part of the year, we should be going out in the sun, starting to get the melanocytes covering our skin. So it protects us from the burning effect of sunlight, but we need sunlight every day. We need to synthesize vitamin D. We store it for a short period of time. Yep. But if you're not out in the sun, if you're not getting vitamin D, and vitamin D has a huge effect on sleeping, snoring, Alzheimer's, but it has a huge effect on our day-to-day -day dental health. Yeah, like it's that role of vitamin D in dental health is, I think, is just one aspect because obviously, you know, it, obviously, as we say, it's we know it's got a role in dental health. We've seen the reports and the studies come out of it. There's been studies now, more I think, as close as 2020, where they've looked at the role of vitamin D in putting in in not filling, sorry, it's in uh, crowns, a crown, sorry. Mm. That one's a new one on me, but I don't know everything. Yeah, so they, they've been talking a lot about like the role of vitamin D when you're like replacing teeth. And the thing is now with vitamin D is like you said with the sunshine is that we don't, because the thing is we've got jobs and doors. And so we struggle to actually get out. And it's between 12 and two where we get the UVB rays, which is what we need to yeah, get into, right. into, yeah. into the skin. And the thing is, a lot of people don't realize is that UVB rays, it takes around about 30 minutes to kind of get your daily dose, not your whole supply for the year uh, your daily dose your mm -hmm. daily required amount of vitamin d and the biggest problem the research has had on vitamin d like you know a lot of the different um specialists and committees on vitamin d what they've struggled with is we don't know how much vitamin d a person's getting not just from the sun but through fortified foods to um supplementation but now i think the core part of this is, is that we can test for it. I mean, 1970s, a test came out, John. It's not long ago, no. but John, that, that, that testing means that any person can get their levels tested. And honestly, I recommend to everyone to get tested every three months. What you would do is you get a test. You'd say, my results are here. We would then give you a calculation and you get it to one point. You then test again in three months and then you, you check again. So you can, get, you can get it from certain food, supplements, it doesn't matter. But as long as you're maintaining a level, and then, you know, from the research that I've personally done and from what I've read, it's around 40 nanograms per milliliter, so it's about 100 nanomoles. They say anything below that is where we know that there's a risk of infection and disease and different conditions. But anything above that is very supportive. And they say after when your body reaches 100 nanomoles, that's when your uh, adipose tissue start storing the vitamin D for the for the, for the winter months. That doesn't mean you should stop taking vitamin D because vitamin D is a half life of 60 days. And so, you know, you really brought that up to me when, when we started talking about vitamin D together. And I think saying the word vitamin D is a horn, hormone is, it's right. I, I do believe that. You I don't need to there. supplement if you're out in the sun and the body naturally makes it. What else does the body naturally make that then you deprive it of. If you are out in the sun, you make vitamin D, you're fine. Yeah. But if we don't go out in the sun, we don't make something. It sort of tells you the body needs to make it. And we don't. And, and, and bears are out in the sun all the time and they store so much vitamin D that allows them to get through the winter. But we're almost hibernating, working in offices like this or dental practices and then going out in the sun and covering cells up and avoiding because we're told to fear the midday sun. And yet that midday sun yeah. is vitamin S, is vitamin sunshine. <laughs> um, you know, that's the vitamin, but vitamin D as a hormone is graining traction. And again, look at the research that's coming up. One thing I want to say is if vitamin D may be contributory towards decay or lack of vitamin D, it contributes towards um, and vitamin C 
looking at towards gum disease and collagen synthesis, you then go to the fact that there are papers there. If you're then spending your thousands and tens of thousands of pounds on implants, look at your vitamin D levels because there's papers out there showing low vitamin D is connected to early implant failure. So if you're going to be spending money and you know a single implant maybe five uh, well three, four, five thousand pounds if you're having multiple ten, fifteen thousand pounds, a test for thirty pounds, thirty five pounds, just to check your vitamin D status and get your vitamin D levels is another factor to make or we'd like to to, to suggest your treatment will be more successful. Because no one wants to have implants put in and all the surgery and then the implants fail. Now, in the practices that I'm working in, we're putting it in, and I can't say it's obligatory, but as a dentist, I test everything. I take an x-ray. I then take sequential x-rays to see changes. If you do a test, whatever the test is, you're putting someone on the map. Then you've got a direction. And if map stands for your master action plan, if you've got low vitamin D, delay the work, get your vitamin D levels right, because there's a better chance of success. And you know what? I'm only talking about teeth. It has knock-on effects throughout the body. Why wouldn't you get to optimal levels? Well, you're essentially, what you're doing is you're saying that the testing is like the foundation before you build everything else because what you're doing is that testing is allowing to give you a basis and saying, right, this person has got this, this, and this, and this. We need to get, we need to do this, this, and this. Then we can do the implants and then the person gets the health back. Yeah. How easy is that? And you see, when I started dentistry, yeah. A dentist treated the mouth. We weren't even allowed to suggest that mercury was coming off and getting into the body and diagnosing mercury toxicity. But the big change came when we started saying gum disease actually influences heart disease, stroke risk, preterm low birth weight babies, and now we're talking about Alzheimer's and dementia. So that's when the shackles came off. That's when we started being mouth doctors to doctors of the whole body. And um, in 2000 to 2002, I studied in America. So I've got another degree in Doctorate of Integrative Medicine. So the mouth was always part of all these other healers with body workers, with nutritionists, with homeopaths. The mouth is always a part. Now, dentistry is only a part of the whole health and healing. And it's the skill of the clinician, be it the dentist or the other practitioner, as to realize how important dentistry is and give people a choice. And getting back to the subject we've, we've talked about, dentistry is becoming more and more expensive. I've benefited from that, which is why I've traveled so well, but it's something that lots of people can't afford. But if there's things you can do that are easy, and it sounds like a plug, but take something to bind the mercury if you can't afford to have the mercury fillings out. If you're pregnant, what do you do? You definitely don't have your mercury fillings taken out when you're pregnant You and when you're breastfeeding as well. So what can you take that stays in your gut to bind any mercury that you're moving? Can you take vitamin D to try and slow down or stave off the effects that it's having on your mouth? So it isn't just get in and do dentistry. You've got to give people choices and the right time is, is, is the most important thing. So, like, the, the, you know, let's, this probably gets to the next point, the next question, really, because the way we kind of met through was through Toxoprofen. It was like the idea, you know, the idea of like using a binder. And, you know, I, I remember coming to you and we presented you the research and the data on the fact that Toxoprofen bound not only to mercury, but to lead, to cadmium, mm -hmm. and then it came on to histamine. And we know how, how histamines relate yeah. to inflammation. And so, and I think you actually built that protocol for us for using tox brand during removing mercury amalgams yeah. and like what is it like how how have you exactly how how have you actually built that protocol what made you build it and what did you think of the protocol how's it worked for you well again go back to the research and you go away and think and the nice thing is i saw the research on clenoptilolite and tox prevent and this is something that we know binds mercury and everyone's used chlorella, um, split cell chlorella, different kinds of chlorella. The research is out there, but they use chlorella to wash mines and pull out heavy metals, and therefore it was extrapolated into using dentistry. And I use chlorella, I think chlorella is great, but here is a product that's come out with science behind it because it shows how it binds mercury and other metals. So the first thing is there are people, and for example, pregnant women, Ah, we can't take mercury fillings out unless we have to, but they can, on a daily basis, use toxic event, and we'll come on to how we use toxic event, because the mercury that is coming off your fillings all the time, 
absolutely guarantee, and anyone tells you it isn't, is telling you a, a porky pie. Um, Mercury is coming off through evaporation, through um, wear and tear, because we all clench and grind our teeth, and through um, dissolution. It's corroding, a bit like rusting. And Toxic Prevent, as a mouthwash, which is the sachets, rinse it round your mouth, it will bind to the free mercury that's in there. It's a push to say the toothpaste that you produce, which binds to toxins, and the toxins are sulfur toxins from uh, gum disease and everything. And that's a big thing. The toxins from gum disease, the sulfur, and that are in root canals, combine with the mercury that's coming for fillings and produce mercaptans, which are incredibly toxic. So if you are sponging up all these toxins coming off root fill teeth and mercury fillings, that's affording a better level of protection than none at all. And if you're, if you're drinking cups of coffee, hot, hot drinks, if you're eating spicy foods, even brushing your teeth causes mercury release. And now, am I going to go on camera and say, I see people who don't come in and brush their teeth because they're worried about the mercury. That's foolish, okay? But what you do is you brush your teeth and then use a binder to hold the mercury. What we then developed is we get people to rinse their mouth with half of a sachet before we drill out mercury fillings using safe protocols. And the protocols will be, uh, you can find it at smart.org, part of the IOMT organization. And this trains dentists how to drill out mercury fillings carefully and safely. Everyone has their own interpretation, but that's what you do. So we get them to rinse out. And then once we've drilled the mercury filling out, we wash it, clean it, try and get all the mercury contamination and we get them to drink the other half of the sachet. So you're lining the, the gut and into the stomach. So if they have ingested any of the mercury, then it binds to it. It's better than doing nothing. And yes, you know, you get bam organic bamboo activated charcoal. I know I've got the research. So if someone questions me, well, here's my research. Um, other products work, I agree, but I'm happy with that. We're then now starting to give them the capsules because when you take a mercury filling out, people are just worried about the mercury that is released when you do it. Yeah. But you take mercury fillings out, you then get the mercury fillings altering how they're connecting with each other electri electrically. The body then sees mercury not coming in as much, so it tries to move mercury out. But the problem is we have a, a system where you have mercury in your bile, it goes down half a yard and gets reabsorbed back in again because most of us have got leaky gut. If you have the toxic prevent capsules, that then is in the small intestine, the large intestine, binds the mercury, you poo it out for want of a better word, and the body says, oh look, there's not as much coming in, I can move more out. So you need to have those binders in the gut, not going into the body, and I don't know the mechanics of taking something that goes all the way to a nerve in your thumb, picks up the mercury, takes it all the way back out again and takes it out of the body. Really doesn't work like that. Yeah. It's a bit like someone taking out the rubbish, binding it, passing it through, and the body says, oh, look, I can put a bit more rubbish into the liver, into the, uh, the bowel, mm. and it goes. So you're constantly cleaning um, the mercury out of the gut and therefore it allows the body to move more mercury from the nerves but the body will do it the way the body works through your, your three detox phases so mouthwash and swallowing it is for the immediate thing and then the capsules afterwards we give them for three days just to take it so anything the body starts to shift it'll do it should you take it as a continual thing it's not a bad thing because we're always exposed to toxins but again if I'm sticking to dentistry. And this is where there is that interesting debate that if you drill out a mercury filling, just going back a touch, if you breathe in the mercury, you absorb 80 to 90% of that mercury. If you wow. swallow the mercury, and everyone's worried about swallowing the water, you absorb six to 8%. So for me, the most important thing when you're having a filling out is medical air, so you're not breathing in just for that moment in time. The dentist has a skill in drilling the filling out quickly and safely. But then if you swallow it, you're taking something like Toxiprevent or Chlorella or activated charcoal, but you're then binding the stuff that you swallowed and you poo it out because you're either going to wee it out, poo it out, sweat it out. Mercury actually also comes out in breath as well. <coughs> and the first person who really talked about mercury toxicity was a guy called, I think, Albert or Alfred Stock, 
who actually used to breathe into large uh, glass uh, bottles and was able to uh, distill out the mercury coming off his fillings. So even wow. breathing mercury uh, is one way we'll get rid of it, even if we don't have mercury fillings. But you need a binder to bind to the mercury just in the gut and it will pass it through. And going back to what I started saying is, we couldn't talk about this 40 years ago because we're not allowed to treat outside the mouth. But with my second degree and the fact that dentistry is now acknowledging to have a whole body effect through sleeping, breathing, snoring, gum disease, we can now say, yes, there is this whole issue of mercury coming out and affecting the body. And Toxoprevent is as good a product as I found, which I'm happy to work and develop with you to this is what you should do. You get to the point of what do you do with people who've got mercury fillings and for whatever reason, they can't afford or it is not appropriate in their life to have mercury fillings. I don't believe it would do anybody any harm to take a regular um, Toxoprevent, maybe you know two tablets twice a day or three times a day. Yes, there's a cost involved in that but you're constantly binding the mercury that's coming off your fillings. You're constantly binding the mercury that the body is trying to get rid of, and therefore you've got this mercury in, mercury out, toxins in, toxins out. And if you look at any of the good German therapies, it's all about detoxification is 50% of any healing. And some of the great homeopaths I've worked with, they would just get people detoxing before they even saw them because we're all toxic bodies. But remember, toxins is chemical. It's the EMFs we're living with, our emotions. So dentistry is only a part of a whole host of healing people. And that's what I learned when I was studying in America. We're, we're a part, but we're a good part of many, many other healing um, disciplines. So my goal going forwards, as old as I am, is if people have dentists they want to start working with, let me work with those dentists. Let me show you the exciting world, my world, 42 years of this excitement. I will work with dentists to try and show them there is great satisfaction, maybe not the financial rewards that some of the other bits of dentistry bring, but the satisfaction of pushing people's health uphill. And leaving one practice, I can see people who I can say after 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, their mouth is healthier and their health is healthier than it was when I first saw them because of what I've done dentistry. So we've answered a lot of questions there, or maybe I've just gone on, but that's what this whole body dentistry is about. This dentistry for health and healing is about. We can influence people's health along with other teams, and we need other teams. We need other team players to actually get people the health they want. So we've talked about you know, I appreciate everything you said today. And, you know, there's a couple of things that you said there with the 80, 90% is inhaled of mercury and 6 to 8% is through gut, which is just surprised me. And the but, research is that, you know, yeah. don't believe me, go and find it. Exactly. That just, that really blew my mind a little bit there. But I think you, we talked about the past or the present. So what do you see is the future of this whole body dental health movement? What do you think the future is going to be now? And again, you've got literally two or three different populations you're going to look at. I genuinely believe we, if we get newborns right and we want to bring them up the organic way, the natural way, whatever word you want to do, it, that is breastfeeding as long as we can, educating them, teaching children if they do have problems, how to breathe properly, how to swallow properly. There are great devices we can use on three and four year old kids, but you've got to have the motivated parents to use munchies to use myo braces and you can look all these up on the internet to see dentists and doing orthodontics at six seven and eight years old rather than wait until they're 13 and 14 because all you're going to do is compound health problems then you've got that middle group of people like me or up to my age who've had dentistry there's a compromise they've had to have fillings they've had to have root canals so the future of dentistry is at least reduce the toxicity on a visit by visit basis. So have mercury fillings removed carefully and safely when appropriate. Have safer, more biological materials in. And yet people will question the composites. Are they safe? Well, give me a mercury filling, give me a composite filling. It's a no brainer. You know, um, yes, there are people who will object to everything, 
but within limits, let's talk about the 80 to 90% of normal people, composites are better. But except there are downfalls of composites. But if you substitute safer materials, that has to be a win-win situation. And then if you have to do more complicated dentistry, such as a root canal, discuss the options. We're introducing an infection, but you know what? We're also keeping a bite. We're, we're sharing the load on your teeth because we want your teeth to last a lifetime. We don't want to take teeth out and then you're chewing on half a dozen teeth because they're not going to last. And this is where you look at implants, which are dentist's way of saying, oops, we failed. We, we can't fill the tooth. We can't root fill it. We'll take it out. You don't want dentures. We'll screw a piece of metal into your body. And implants have been a lifesaver in my, in my career. But is it safe to put metals in your mouth? Is it safe to put mercury, um, mercury fillings and titanium implants in your mouth? Well, there's more and more dentists now, and I'm fortunate enough to work with some, we're putting ceramic implants in. I've been putting ceramic implants in for 15 years. They're fantastic. So you don't have to use metals. You can avoid metals. And again, you'll get the detractors of implants, but you've got to give people choices. You know, the detractors we'll never get anywhere. You've got to work with the patient to see what they want. But then you've got that third generation of people who getting, you know, 65 and onwards, they want to enjoy a fulfilling and healthy life. And because dementia and Alzheimer's is now becoming more and more common, is what they have in their mouth contributing to their health, their poor health going forwards. And so if we look at getting gum disease, which is going to help people who have diabetes because the older the person, the more risk of, uh, of diabetes, uh, is it getting rid of mercury fillings and Google mercury fillings and heart disease and you will find the studies. Don't believe me, find the studies. And reducing the amount of mercury in your mouth will also have a net effect on so many other illnesses. But I think the big thing that we can accept, oh, we're going to have a stroke, we're going to have a heart disease, but this slow lingering ill health of dementia and Alzheimer's, look up how dentistry can help. I've signed up for some training, but it's really just distilling all the training I've done, which is materials, which is infections, be they root canals or gum disease, and then how everything fits together and the dentist's role on helping you get a good night's sleep because healing starts with sleep. And if you don't sleep properly, then you're never gonna heal as well. And dentistry has a way of either improving the bite, training you to strengthen lips, cheek and tongue, even making things to bring your jaw forwards so you can breathe better at night. And if you have a good night's sleep, not waking up two or three times to go for a wee, and the physiology will show you if your mouth breathes, you get up and wee more because it changes your body chemistry. If you breathe through your mouth, different carbon dioxide levels as if you breathe through your nose. Now isn't the time, but we can do that at a later date. But breathing through your nose, not breathing through your mouth, and everyone's taping their mouth at the moment because they've seen sports people do it. Do it properly. Find a good Buteco practitioner, and I can give you the names of good Buteco practitioners. And Patrick McEwen, who I know I'm visiting in a couple of weeks' time, he's set off a revolution. And of course, everyone then changes it in our ways better than. Go to source, go to source, learn about Buteco breathing. And he acknowledges you need all the teeth where they should be, fitting together the way they should be, all the muscles strengthened. But if you have a mantra from the child and whole body dentistry, to the old person, a whole body dentistry, and everyone in between is lips together, tongue to the roof of your mouth, breathing through your nose, swallowing without any movement, mm -hmm. and then safest materials, reduced infections in the body. That is what whole body dentistry, and that's the future of dentistry. Okay. Absolutely. So, one question for you. Actually, I've got two questions for you, John. First one is this, is like, what is like, so this, this interview that we're doing today, what is the biggest take home that someone watching this for the first time should take away from this video? What's the biggest takeaway they should take? My perspective has changed through the years and, and someone once said, if you quote me, date me. If I was to start my career again, which is another way of asking the same question, I would do everything about developing the jaws, lips, cheek, uh, lips together, tongues to the roof, mouth and breathing. Because if you put everything in the right place, then you're going to get less dental disease. My honest belief. So your takeaway is like... You, start. you start with the children. The thing is, we've got 60 million people in this country who've already gone down the path of maybe not ideal. 
So it is safe as materials as you can, less infections in the mouth, and do what you can, not only with drugs, but nutrition, homeopathy, chemicals, uh, things like your, your toxin toothpaste. Reducing toxins in the body, and dentistry is a big contributor. Using your body the way it was designed to breathe through your nose, get clear sinuses. So work with a dentist, and I truly believe anything I do as a dentist is working with a compromise. And either I can fudge it and fake it, or I can make it as good as I can. Now you can get the builders who will cover over problems for a later date, or you can say, you got a problem, Let's do it as best we can. It's never going to be right. And that's why little and often dentistry is sometimes better than this. Oh, let's just make it good. But in 10 years time, it all needs to be done again. So less dentistry. And there's, um, there's, there's a phrase at the moment where dentists are doing less and less drilling and keep on patchy and repairing. Because even keeping your teeth and not drilling them down is good biological dentistry and say, oh, I can drill that down and put a crown on it. Biolo dental tissue is so sacred. You feel with your teeth. They're meridians. They take in energy when you eat food. Teeth are connected to meridians. We haven't talked about that. But the whole energetics, the energetics are getting mercury out. People say, I feel better. It's nothing to do with the mercury. It's to do with the vibrations of the yeah. mercury. It is to do with the electricity in the body. It, it becomes vast. But the middle people, just as good a dentistry you can do with the principles of how nature wanted you to be, but it's a compromise. And the old people, maybe more drastic dentistry. Do you want to leave infections in your mouth when you know it's affecting your health? Do you want to leave materials in your mouth well, we know it's affecting your health. And if getting your health is more of a priority than making your teeth look good, accept slightly harsher dentistry, losing root filled and infected teeth, losing metal fillings, because if that has been shown to improve your health and your quality of health in later life, accept the dentures. Accept, because it's no good going to an early grave with dementia or Alzheimer's, as seems to be shown, with a beautiful set of teeth, whereas <laughs> it, the teeth aren't quite as good, but you're enjoying better health, which do you want? Yeah. So you've got that youngsters who will never need the problem, the middle people like us, we've got to live with it, but do as best we can, and the older people accept that what's been done has been done with the right intent, but by keeping it, how much are you prepared to let go? And all of our people's journeys towards health, half of the question, and I think Hippocrates said it, how much are you prepared to let go? Oh, I want to still eat bread. I can't do without my beer on a Friday night. Well, fine, don't enjoy as much health. And this is this whole concept of what health is really all about. Give someone good health for a week, and then it's their choice as to how close they can get to it. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good, uh, I think that's a really good takeaway, I think. That's a, I can't, I can't add to that, John. <laughs> I really can't add to that, my friend. Uh, John, just want to say thank you so much for today. We really, we do appreciate it. And we'll definitely get you back on again to do some more discussions. I think next topic we'll be covering is breathing. I'd love more. to do that. Yeah. And, and the science. And if perhaps we can then start to do this with some slides that people can take home and really understand. Yeah. Breathing and sleeping. If I could deliver that, over drilling holes in teeth. That's what I want to do. And in fact, that's what I'm going to do with my career going forwards. Less drilling, more breathing. Ah, brilliant. Thank you, John. My pleasure. I'm going to do John's uh, vitamin D test today because I think we've talked about vitamin D and, you know, our dental health. And I think it's only important that the speaker gets tested. So right now I'm going to use our instant vitamin, well, should I say our rapid vitamin D test to check John's vitamin D results. And we're going to present them to you today. This is a very expensive vial of Dr. John Roberts's uh, blood here that we're going to mix together. So I've mixed John's blood and we're just going to start performing the test. John, we've got your results. Tell me, I have a big boy, tell so, me. So, your results have come in at 49.5 oh. nanograms per milliliter, which means if you do the conversion, it's 123.9 nanomoles per liter. So that is level four, which means good levels of vitamin D. That's it, it's very good. Farewell. 
I do try and practice what I preach and sunshine is a nutrition for me and hence I'm going to India for a month in January and some of it will be I want sunshine and I know we all know that sunshine is good for us. Good to hear. Don't be afraid of sunshine. Not too much, but don't be afraid of sunshine.